It's a pleasure now to welcome Eric Lander, um, who's an associate member of the Koch Institute. And you may or may not know this, but Eric actually started out his academic life not in science, but as a faculty member on the Harvard University Graduate Business School, teaching math and science-related business. But during that time, he became fascinated by genetics um, and worked in a number of different labs at Harvard and MIT to really understand this topic. And then having learned the error of his ways, he then moved to the Whitehead Institute, first as a fellow, then as a faculty member in the Department of Biology, then head of the Genome Center, and now head of the Broad Institute. So of all of you know, Eric's name is basically synonymous with all things genomic. Um, he's been awarded um, numerous honors. Um, I think perhaps the most um, uh, well-known now is that he serves on the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. And it's a pleasure to have him here today. And he's going to talk about the human genome and cancer. Eric. Thank you. Well, th thanks very much, Jackie. Um, first, I just want to say how excited, you know, both as an associate member of the Koch Institute and as a member of the Broad Institute, whose window looks out on the building going up, how excited we are to see the progress there. And there are all sorts of plans to put in zip lines between the two buildings to have people go zipping back and forth, just clipping on and things. Um, wh what I'd like to do is, is talk about just a couple of mostly unpublished stories that relate uh, the human genome and cancer. Uh, as Jackie said, I, I like all things genomic. Um, why do I like all things genomic? Um, well, because when you do genomic things, you can take a global perspective. You can see all sorts of patterns that you had no reason to expect in the first place. And they can emerge in different ways. You know, the first things I got excited about with, with many others was making maps and sequences of the human genome. But in the years since, it's been possible to build more and more kinds of maps. And all of these maps tell you different things. Maps of all the genes encoded in the genome, of all the evolutionary conservation in the genome, of chromatin states of the genome, of inherited variation of disease disease associations, of evolutionary selection, and relevant to this particular meeting, uh, to the distribution of targets of cancer mutation. So I like genomic maps because you can find surprises. Now, I'll note that there is, in the world of cancer and genomics, this controversy or tension, which is represented by, um, most recently, a pair of editorials. Um, describing the tension, and it's an important dynamic tension between hypothesis-driven and non-hypothesis-driven research. And of course, you know, the right answer is we need both. It's an ecosystem where data gives rise to hypotheses, and hypotheses cause you to do experiments that give rise to data. So one can't come down on one side or the other of this tension. But I do want to speak you know, for the next few minutes about the power of large, unbiased genomic surveys uh, for understanding the mechanisms of cancer. So that's the plan. Now, to do that, I first want to just set a little bit of, of the context of how rapidly genomics has advanced since the time of the Human Genome Project. What has gone on in the last seven, 10 years, depending on you know, what you take as the end of the Human Genome Project. The end of the Human Genome Project was announced on multiple occasions with appropriate ceremony each time. And so it was seven to 10 years between when, you know, depending on how you count. So let's, let me talk just a little bit about um, what's gone on since the time of the Human Genome Project and now. So the Human Genome Project was just one big project. It was get a complete map and sequence of the human genome. It involved about 13 years of work of making a genetic map and a physical map and a sequence map and making all that information available and all that. And it took some significant changes in technology to get 3 billion bases times about seven or eight-fold coverage, something like 20 or 30 billion bases of information. It required changing the way we do things so you could make large automated uh, systems so you didn't have to have thousands and thousands of graduate, student, graduate students doing the work, which the graduate students object to, but you'd have machines doing the work and generating a lot of data. 
It involved, you know, international collaborations between all sorts of groups. And I remember the day that the whole international consortium celebrated the billion base bash, when across the world we had covered one billion bases of the human genome to about sevenfold coverage. Great celebration. And then, you know, about 10 years ago this month, uh, the celebration of a rough draft sequence of the human genome, which was actually published uh, about nine months later in February, and of a complete sequence of the genome published around uh, April of 2003, where complete doesn't mean complete. It means almost complete. There's still about 300 gaps in the sequence of the human genome, but not a big deal. Um, but I always feel obliged to say that, that, that there are some, some important gaps still to fill there. Since then, the world of DNA sequencing has undergone this amazing acceleration. Um, it's been driven, as so many of these things are, by technology. New types of sequencing machines that let you proceed in a massively parallel fashion. Uh, from the old days of capillary sequencers and 96 sequences that you would read, these technologies that spread many DNA molecules on a surface and do serial chemistry, adding typically one base at a time and imaging it, or many of the same base at a time and imaging it, but letting you read in parallel and exploiting as your chemistry gets better and better and your optics get better and better, the tremendous parallelism that's possible. So I want to give you a feeling for what that increase has felt like. This is a graph we used to be very proud of. Is there a laser weapon up here? So, I don't know. Anyway, well, I'll just, I'll just this gesticulate and you'll imagine. Um, this, is, this is sequence data produced here at MIT from 1999 when we were so proud we produced a billion bases of raw sequence, going up to almost 20 billion bases a year, going up to almost 70 billion bases a year of raw sequence being produced here at MIT through the year 2006. This is what happened with two more years of data added to that. It jumps up from 70 billion bases there, whoops, backward, jumps up from there at 70 billion bases, two more years, it looks like that, to about 1,700 billion bases through, 19, through 2008. Um, and then if I add one more year to this graph, this is what it looks like. 2008 is down there. And now it's up to 20,000 billion bases of sequence produced last year. And if I add my projection for Christmas this year, it's 100,000 billion bases of sequence by Christmas. And if you ask me about 2011, I think it's fivefold above that. That's the rate at which this is going. Uh, costs, of course, are dropping. This isn't due to a 10 to the fifth fold increase in budget. This is due, in fact, to a 10 to the fifth fold decrease in cost, um, important to say. And what you see in the black line there is Moore's law that's dropping on a logarithmic scale linearly by a you know, factor of two every 18 months. And what you see in the red line is the cost of sequencing, which by the end of 2010, by Christmas or so, will have completed a decrease of about 10 to the fifth fold over the course of about a decade. And nothing I know in history has ever decreased in cost 10 to the fifth fold in so short a time. So all right, what's it good for? Well, it's good for making more and more kinds of maps. And I want to describe two different types of maps, and in particular, cancer maps. And I'm going to describe one particular story. And then I'll also talk about chromatin state maps and things we're learning about them that appear to be relevant to cancer, too. And if there's time, I'll mention one other thing. So mapping the cancer genome has been an effort that a number of people around this community at MIT and Harvard around the, the Broad Cancer Program have gotten together around, particularly Todd Golub, Matt Meyerson, Levi Garraway, and Stacy Gabriel. Now, obviously, the idea that the genome is very important in cancer has been around for quite a while, since Boveri published in 1914 the idea that chromosomal defects cause cancer. There was the little detour of 1970, the declaration that the viral origin of the majority of malignant tumors was now documented beyond any reasonable doubt. One should always be suspicious of statements like that. But within not so long after that, the demonstration of cellular oncogenes and the demonstration by 1986 of all the major kinds of mutations that you would expect, they all can occur point mutations and translocations and amplifications and deletions, all those examples were known by the mid-1980s. That led, in fact, Renato Lubecco 
to argue in an important uh, article in Science that a major reason for sequencing the human genome should be for cancer, so that we could take systematic approaches to cancer. Well, um, in about four or five years ago, uh, a group, Lee Hartwell and I, and a group on the National Cancer Institute's advisory board, began talking about the idea of a cancer genome project to begin to document all of the mutations that occur with any significant frequency in cancer. It was still technologically a little ways off, but it seemed like it might become possible. Now, there were concerns raised. One concern, all the cancer genes have already been learned. There's nothing more to discover. The other concern was there are so many cancer genes, we'll never be able to make sense of it. One wanted at times to get those two sides to sort of hash it out with each other. But in any case, I'm a firm believer of, in the middle, that we don't by any means know all of the mechanisms in cancer. And yet, it's not so infinitely complicated that we can't work it out. So in support of that, what I'd like to do is describe, I'm going to scroll down to right there, but also describe the kind of approaches that are getting used. They are sequence the entire genome of a tumor and a normal and compare them. When you compare a random person's blood to a random person in the population, you'll find, on average, one polymorphism every 1,000 bases. When you compare someone's tumor to their normal, you find, on average, one mutation every million bases. And you can do this by sequencing the whole genome or by, for example, sequencing any selected part, like the exome, using a capture technology. 